Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Do the Change podcast, where we're challenging and reimagining OEHS. And so in this podcast, we are focusing on upcoming and current and present leaders in their field and how they got to where they are today, with a special focus on the field of occupational health and environmental uh, health sciences. But we do focus on topics outside of that because they do overlap and intersect in a lot of ways. So we're going to be talking about the hills and valleys of their journeys and also get some insight into some non-traditional paths into the field. So my name is Tyra Parrish, and, I, and I'm a recent graduate here from the MPH program at Cal. And our guest um, for this episode is Bavia Joshi. Did I say your last name correctly? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I was like, I know how to say it. Okay. So Bavia is a doctor of public health candidate at the School of Public Health at um, Berkeley. She hailed from India and as a global public health fellow, uh, Center for African um, Studies fellow, and alumni of the Bixby Center Summer Fellowship Class of 2022. And she's also a human rights fellow, class of 2022. Um, her research focuses on understanding the, product, the reproductive needs of marginalized populations in low and middle income countries in times of crisis. She will be conducting her doctoral research with refugee and internally displaced women and girls in South Sudan. In 2022, she worked with Ukrainian uh, women refugees in Croatia to understand their unmet reproductive health needs. As a woman human rights advocate and educator, Bavia supports um, women's rights defenders from across the globe to build their capacity to use international human rights, human rights mechanisms for advocacy and activism at national, regional, and international levels. Before starting this program, Bavia managed, implemented, and evaluated public health projects in South Asia for more than six years. Her research has been in sexual and reproductive health, WASH, waste management, market fa facilitation, health finance, health systems, um, economic empowerment of women, and using user-centered design to improve health outcomes in marginalized communities. Bavia received her MA in International Law and Human Rights from the United, from the United Nations, a mandated university for peace in Costa Rica, and her bachelor's is in political science from Delhi University in India. Did I say that right? You did. Awesome. Okay. Just checking in. <laughs> um, so we are so happy to have you on this podcast. I'm super excited because I know you have a lot of amazing things to share. Um, thank you, so we're first thank you for having me today. Of course. We're so I'm I'm very happy to be here. Um, <laughs> and so we're gonna start with the check-in question first, which is um, if you could share a surprising or unexpected moment that made you smile this week. Wow, there were a few to be honest because okay, I was sure. actually on a vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all of last week, and I did have some very special moments. Uh, some yeah. of them also surprising and unexpected. But the one I'll mention um, was about um, an experience that I had doing snorkeling, and this was the first mm -hmm. time I was uh, doing it in the second largest coral reef of the world. And you know how we speak about the. Uh, the corals being damaged and how you know the our our actions are kind of impacting um you know their health uh, mm -hmm. it was very interesting to see that live and so that was the more like a surprising okay. kind of element where I did not expect it to be that impacted despite mm -hmm. hearing so much about that discourse right but it was definitely something that made me um the whole experience was something that made me smile because just kind of experiencing that beauty was, um, mm -hmm. I think it was one of my best dips and my most favorite dips of my life. Uh, but it was, it was surprising and glaring also. So it was a very interesting experience because I kind of came out of that dip um, mm -hmm. feeling a lot of things, but also a big component of surprise and, um, and disheartenment in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's such a, that's such an awesome experience to have in the sense of like what you were sharing about how you're seeing, you said it was like the second largest like coral reef that's ever. It. And then also the, the other side of it, which is like, okay, the reality of like, it, it is what people are saying. And if not, probably like more stark when you're like looking at it, but that's, that's really exactly. cool that you got to see it. Yeah. Yeah, um, it was a brilliant experience, but but yeah. yeah, it came with its own um yeah, its own pluses and minuses, I would say. Yeah. Um, I think 
What am I thinking? Oh, something for me that made me smile this week was I've, I've started shadowing a doctor. That's a whole other separate thing, but shadowing in pediatrics and like really loving it. And I think seeing from like, from a non-patient side now of trying, thinking about where, like what specialty kind of aligns with me and like being able to shadow this really amazing um, pediatrician, Dr. Perlman. I love her and I'm so glad I would recommend it to her. Um, but seeing what type of doctor she is, how she shows up in this space um, and also seeing she has bears around her, um, what's it called? I think, I don't know if it's called a stethoscope. It might be uh, the thing that doctors wear around their neck. Yeah, I did. Um, I shouldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. She has little, she has little bears around oh, it. So and for cute. the longest time, right. I was like, oh, it's cute. For the longest time, I was like, why? Like, does it help with her neck? Like I thought it was like a comfort thing. So it's not hurting her neck. No, she got it so that when she's um, trying to listen to a kid's heartbeat, they have something to focus on for those kids who like are kind of antsy a little bit. And so it made me smile to see like a little kid. Oh, like the bear. And she's like, oh, great. Great. Like all your vitals and stuff. That's adorable. Right. And it made me smile because it's it's just being a being a pediatrician requires a lot of patience, a lot of kindness, yeah. a lot of like she she is so good at like um empowering um like the kids because it's like from age zero to when they're I think twenty-two. Mm-hmm. Um, but seeing how she empowers them in their health is super amazing. And it just made me smile to be to, to be like, oh, if I can be at least half of what she is, it'll be good. <laughs> so yeah, definitely smart. an inspiration. Definitely an inspiration. But how thoughtful of yeah. her to do that. Right. And yeah, especially with a population that, you know, would be, I mean, just the age that they're at, these experiences shape so much of what they become in the future. And I think mm-hmm. that that's very thoughtful of her. Yeah, yeah. So that, Thank you for sharing that experience. Oh, ah, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so speaking of just pediatrics and health, um, can you walk us through how you got into public health and specifically kind of the field of reproductive health? How did you, like, what was that journey like? For sure. I'll take a few minutes on this one because it's been a while. Yes. <laughs> um, Please. <laughs> I think my interest in this topic comes a lot from my experiences of living in India as a woman. Mm-hmm. Um, India is many things. It's a country of rich culture, uh, you know, colorful uh, textiles, uh, spicy curries, and so much more. But it is also a country of rigid patriarchal structures and gender inequalities, where I unfortunately faced the plight of toxic masculinity and misogyny all through my childhood and adolescence. Mm -hmm. And due to the cultural context that I was growing up in, I was deprived of any preparation for puberty, particularly menstruation. And that was a big life-changing event uh, for me in my life, obviously, as an adolescent, or of any bodily knowledge um, that I should have had as an adolescent who was experiencing puberty. So once I hit puberty, I was actually swimming pretty deep into these stereotypes and taboos that are associated with menstruation or women's reproductive health, which snowballed very quickly into um, me being exposed uh, to abuse, harassment, and toxic relationships during most of my adolescence. And to be honest, Tyra, under these circumstances, if one is not determined and focused on what they want. It is a very swift, quick and swift burial into the social and cultural waves. And so um, I always thought if in my privileged bubble, I could undergo these experiences, um, I shuddered to think about uh, thousands and millions of women and girls who live in settings who do not have the resources to to either access reproductive health services or, um, you know, express their autonomy or, uh, you know, decision-making authorities uh, to access these services or just kind of be aware and knowledgeable about them. And so I think my journey into reproductive health started pretty early on. Mm -hmm. And I was interested from the very early on, like I said, to understand um, especially the challenges that women face in marginalized communities and what are Mm -hmm. And how does some of these gender inequalities that exist uh, very inherently in in a culture like India, how do they then impact 
um, a women's reproductive health journey across her reproductive health cycle, right? And so yes. I uh, pursued my master's in international law and human rights, which might seem a very different subject, but honestly, health is a human right. And yes. so when I did get training into human rights, I automatically took the route of women's uh, human rights and the movement related to that. And then from there um, into sexual reproductive health and rights. So it was actually a very organic path that I took mm-hmm. up the master's. And then I went ahead and did another academic training in peace and conflict studies and how that kind of uh, almost impact women's reproductive health, like Yes. Places. And that again, organically, amalg- if I amalgamated both my academic trainings, it kind of created um, the topic that I'm focusing and working on um, for my doctoral research. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also, in the process, obviously worked in India and South Asia region for about six years or so. And so I think all of that together came um, into. Um, creating my doctoral research proposal and 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 the space that I'm working in, which is uh, women's reproductive health access for primarily refugee and internally displaced women mm-hmm. in conflict and crisis settings. Um, and really at the heart of my work is reproductive empowerment, promoting women's rights, reaching the furthest behind first, yes. and addressing health, health inequalities in those communities. Yeah, and I think I I really love that that last part you said where you're like kind of reaching to those that are furthest in the back and helping them because I think mm-hmm. that there's like a misconception of like like um you help the ones who are kind of the four front facing ones and that helps everybody but really there's been a lot more studies and conversations about if you help those who are the furthest back or the ones who are like quote unquote, the furthest, like at the bottom, for lack of better phrasing, that when you help those folks, you help everybody. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I really love that, you, like your folks is like, no, I'm not going for quote unquote, low hanging fruit. I'm going for the fruit all the way at the top, because that person or those groups matter as well. Exactly. Um, and like you rightly said, unfortunately, because yeah. it's not the low hanging fruit, those populations are automatically marginalized even further by the system itself, because we don't reach them because they are the most exactly. difficult to reach. We have right. so many barriers and challenges and even accessing those populations mm. that a lot of yes. times because of resource constraints or, you know, because of uh, decision making at these higher levels or, you know, by even researchers in global health, they right. just opt for a more um, easier path, right. for a lack of a better word, um, and a more uh, feasible path, if I may say so, because yeah. it is extremely challenging a lot of times to reach these populations. And a lot of right. these forcibly displaced populations in particular are very dynamic. Yeah. They are not right. at one place. So it's it's right. tough to kind of follow them and work with them and and with respect to reaching the furthest behind it's actually a human rights principle which is um a principle on which the sustainable development goals are also grounded the purpose of sustainable development goals from a human rights lens is to reach the furthest behind first and i think mm-hmm. that re- because of my human rights training that that is very central and key to my uh, work as well yeah and and i think i i wanted to follow up of because of your background in human rights mm-hmm. and your background also in like, you talked about like peace and conflict, like resolution or mm-hmm. just that kind of that topic. Mm-hmm. What drew you specifically to Berkeley Public Health for that like doctoral kind of now like addition on top of like what you've already like got training and if that makes sense. Like what about Berkeley Public Health was like, this is the extra thing that I need. Or, yeah. Like, like, I- I mean, I do think the faculty is great. And I yes. found an advisor who um, was in alignment with my interest mm-hmm. and the research that I wanted to do. And I, I I, needed that. I didn't want my doctoral journey to be dictated by a research that I am not passionate about. Exactly. And I got that space at, at Berkeley Public Health. Even in my initial conversations with faculty members at Berkeley, Mm-hmm. It was even before I applied, right? I started contacting faculty members. They got in touch. They were invested. They were supportive of the topic. Mm-hmm. And um, and there was almost a component of individuality in this yes. research. 
where I was carving my own path in way and I was getting the support that I needed when I needed it. Yes. And, and having at the age that I'm at with the experience and, you know, the direction that I want my future to take, I felt that is the sort of dynamics I needed with my yeah. And I found that. So I think that was extremely key. The mm-hmm. second important, I think, a component uh, for my decision making was the formation and the structure of the cohort itself. Okay. I'll be very honest, uh, some of the most prestigious schools um, their DRPH cohorts look very similar to one another with a very similar background and profile. It's almost like they fit a certain template and they're in. Mm-hmm. Right? I think Berkeley Public Health, especially the DRPH cohort, it was diverse. It was representative of various communities, of mm-hmm. various identities, and it had people from across the globe. And okay. I felt that as a doctoral student, I fit better in a cohort like that. I will Mm -hmm. learn better. I will be exposed to more experiences and learnings in a space and a cohort like that. And that was a big component of my decision making to get at Berkeley Public Health as well. And finally, to be very honest, there needs to be a practical part to it. I did have a good funding offer from from, uh, Berkeley Public Health. And Mm -hmm. in addition to that, I could also see a visible roadmap to seek additional financial support and find opportunities to sustain myself for a period of three to four years, which this program takes before it yes. to wrap up. And that visible roadmap was probably not as visible um, in several other institutions uh, that I applied at. And so I think these were three key, key components uh, for me to, to make that decision to come here. Awesome. And I, I think if I want to kind of step out a little bit of like, uh-huh. so in general, what, what pushed you to get just like a doctorate in public health? So before you chose Berkeley, what was kind of the thought process of like, okay, I'm going to pursue a doctorate in public health. And then if you can also, you kind of touched on it, but also the research um, that you're doing in um, South Sudan, I believe is what you shared. Yeah. Um, um, sure. So I think the first part is that DRPH is a professional track doctoral program. It's not an academic track like the like a PhD, yes. right? And typically, uh, people who come into these uh, programs come with prior work experience. Mm-hmm. And, um, so it almost creates a space of like-minded people who have mm-hmm. already made impact in the world or in the spaces that they come from in various ways Mm -hmm. right and I think that is what that is one of the things that stood out for me for a DRPH program versus a PhD Mm -hmm. right the second thing is uh, DRPH is an interdisciplinary program Mm -hmm. Right. And Berkeley somehow nurtures that interdisciplinary nature of it in a very beautiful way. Um, The opportunities that come with it being interdisciplinary is beyond the scope of School of Public Health. You can collaborate with faculty members, with centers from across the campus. And as you just mentioned while you were introducing, I've been affiliated with the Human Rights Center, with the Center for African Studies, for centers that are also placed outside of the school. And I've, I have advisors on my committee who are not from the School of Public Health. And mm-hmm. it kind of was fitting very naturally with my academic background, which is also very interdisciplinary. But very um still in tandem right it's not uh it's not all very different from each other mm-hmm. um, they kind of these fields kind of coexist and i think that is the beauty of public health in general as a field that it is very interdisciplinary and so do to do a doctoral program that facilitates that interdisciplinary nature was very important for me and it was very um, um, I'm crucial for me in my next, um, you know, academic steps that I was taking. And mm-hmm. thirdly, related to this, because I had a background in human rights and law, peace and conflict studies, gender studies, etc. I, I was working actually in sexual reproductive health for most, most of my career, most of my professional life mm-hmm. with the with this interdisciplinary academic training also. So okay. at the end, I kind of wanted to end with an academic training that is more rooted in public health so that I also get the academic exposure that public health professionals get when they yes. do public health 
degree or a program so mm-hmm. i think for me it was almost again very organic in the sense that it it was it was a marriage made in heaven kind of a situation where i was like oh all these fields kind of work really well i understand how my work fits in all these three fields um and it amalgamates these three fields together in some mm-hmm. way and doing a doctor of public health at this juncture of my life and my career would make complete sense and i think that's what made me pursue a drph um and the specific research that i'll be conducting to be honest it's a process you kind of yes. with that topic as a part of the program and that's again like i said the beauty of it that you go through that process and you learn in that process um mm-hmm. for me there was some like i said natural connection with my previous academic backgrounds but also mm-hmm. uh, i've been in reproductive health all my life i've not worked in many other spaces right and yes. so it was almost um when i spoke to my advisor we almost knew this is a sort of research we are doing uh, mm-hmm. we mostly honed in on it and defined it better once i got into the program gotcha mm-hmm. okay and i think if you can um just for folks who don't know the difference between refugees and internally displaced people do you mind just defining it because i feel that sure. sometimes they get kind of like conflated and like no they're, they're interchangeable and they're really Absolutely. not no they're yeah. not so you're they're right yeah kind of exactly there. so so both populations are defined as forcibly displaced meaning yes. people who've been forcibly displaced from their homes Mm-hmm. um the united nations high commissioner for refugee unhcr which is the key un body that kind of uh, focuses on these populations and work around them defines a uh, refugee as people who've been displaced from their homes but they leave their homes and countries and cross borders into an other country so yes. to to get a refugee status you have to cross border into another country internally displaced persons are also forcibly displaced because of a crisis or a conflict or any of that but stay within the borders of their countries that's why they are internally displaced mm-hmm. and so externally displaced almost becomes like a refugee so right. that's the difference between the two okay thank you so much for defining that cuz i think that's it's very important it's it's a it's a it's a i wouldn't say it's a it's a important distinction when you're using these words and for folks who are interested in doing human rights work those distinctions are important um, absolutely and thank you for pointing it out because a lot of times when we're working in the field we use these jargons almost as if everyone gets yeah. it uh, and i appreciate you kind of um asking me to break it down please continue to do that if i yeah i mean to use any jargons that that yeah. needs to be broken down further no it's it's okay and honestly you're the best person to ask right because this is the work that you're doing so i was like actually let's just ask <laughs> you're an expert let's ask Thank you. like what yeah um yeah um so uh before moving on to the next kind of topic shift um mm-hmm. in your journey to public health and into reproductive health and into the field of reproductive health were there any mentors or role models um who kind of pushed you there and or kept you there in those moments where you're like oh my gosh like what is going on um yeah so uh, how did they contribute to kind of your growth and development in the field No that's a great question thank you for kind of adding it into this conversation mm-hmm. um i genuinely from the bottom of my heart think that i am a product of support and sacrifices of many people in my life um it is really difficult to say that um i'm going to name like top 3 right because i i know what has gone into the process for me to get here yes. and i'm not even any big shot or anything nothing right but still even for me to get here it's been a journey and it has been an input from many 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 people mm-hmm. um having said that my role model is definitely my mother mm-hmm. she has been that rock for me like you just said in every situation i have cried i have howled i have failed i have succeeded i have had you know um good moments happy moments and through all of it she's been my rock um and in the recent years uh, my husband as well but but i think while i was growing up and i started to work on on this topic like i said it's a very taboo subject right and i was coming from um a family or from from a background where women rights were not the way 
uh, were not the same as they are today, right? Mm -hmm. And if, from that era, right? And so I had restrictions like be back home before dark, um, you know, report every time you leave. And I, I understand a lot of that comes from a safety perspective from a parent as well. But I think it was my mom who said, who kind of started pushing some of those boundaries with me because I was obviously rebelling, right? Mm -hmm. But if there's no one to listen to that rebel and <laughs> accept that change, that rebel is of no use. And I think it was my mom who started doing that first. Um, she's always been a working woman. She's a working woman till date. She told mm -hmm. me the importance of... Um, economic empowerment she yes. told me the importance of education she got married really early on uh, she finished her graduation while she was pregnant with me and I'm a second child um, and so she she realized that if I do not educate myself to the extent that I want to there will be something that I'm missing out all my life and so mm -hmm. she kind of imbibed that uh, importance of education in my life to an extent that I was the first person in my family extended family even who left my country as a woman um, mm -hmm. to go abroad and study and um, yeah and she I remember the first time I proposed this idea my dad was like no this is not happening and I got a lot of pushback but it was her dream along with mine that made it happen and I remember how that year we turned so many people in support of fulfilling this dream and from there there's not not been any like we've not looked back right but yeah. I think it was those crucial moments where um where her support and her vision helped me turn the tables that I could not have done at my own Mm -hmm. of my own basically and in that journey I think I would like to name a mentor her name is Alda Fasio she's a very renowned feminist jurist and human rights activist advocate uh, from Central America she's uh, served uh, in the United Nations human rights systems in several positions she has drafted many many documents with pertaining to women's uh, rights and advancing them and she was one of my mentors in my master's program. So imagine a 22-year-old girl in the other part of the world who's not stepped out of her home in darkness until now, literally. Yeah. And she's living in another part of the world. And there is this woman who comes and says, let's make what you want to achieve happen. And it's that date into date that I work with her. And we work closely on advancing women human rights uh, for women across the globe and mm -hmm. advocating for their rights at the United Nations human rights systems. So um, while there are many people, and I do acknowledge their support throughout my journey, I think these two people will always stand out for me because they were there with me when no one else was. Yeah, and I, I think I want to pause and just say thank you for sharing that because that is, I felt like I was hearing someone tell my story because that's who my mom is to me, where it's like, yeah. and also I totally relate with it. It's very hard. To, to name top three or top five, because you realize it's those, it could even be those people who are really kind to you or someone in passing who just told you, Hey, have you heard about blah, blah, blah topic? And you never saw them again. That's someone in your journey, you know? So I just want to pause and uplift that because that's very real where, and it's not really getting teary eyed, but it is, it's like, you are the reflection of 30 or something people who decided to show up for you in a really important moment. And for people where it's like your parents, um, or like your mom, when you shared where that's my relationship with my mom, where if my mom wasn't telling me like, no, you're right. Like the way you're feeling is right. Or encouraging me to push when I was like, I'm not sure if this is something I should push on. My mom was like, no, you can do it. And here's why. Um, uh -huh. That's really amazing. And it's really amazing to hear how your mom showed up for you and also pushed you. And even, even the fact that she was supporting a dream of yours and giving you that space to, if you did want to do it, she's like, I'm here for you. But if she doesn't want to do it, she's still here for you. And that's sometimes all a person needs. Absolutely. And I just shout out to your mom. I've never met her, but she sounds like an amazing woman. No, and she is. And shout out to your moms and all the moms, right? Because they yes. need sacrifices in their generations as well. And they yes. do recognize that they need to support us to kind of not let that history repeat itself for exactly that. and so um and it's not been easy for them they've kind of stood up against their loves, loved ones as well for us right, right. and I think it takes right. a lot of strength and courage for everyone 
to show up for someone else and they did and many other people did and I can only be thankful and grateful for them in our lives and exactly. um, the impact that they've made subtly for our generation exactly mm-hmm. and so with that I'm going to do a topic shift kind of because we've actually been talking about human rights a lot so this isn't really a big of a topic shift but now specifically can you talk about this human rights fellowship that you've mentioned um, mm-hmm. for those who may not know first time hearing it um, and if you can talk about um, what just overview of what the fellowship is about and what that like process is like applying, interviewing, and then getting that fellowship. Sure. Um, so the Human Rights Fe- Fellowship is offered by the Human Rights Center at Berkeley, um, which is um, just by the law school. It's it's a very sweet, archaic kind of building, uh, rustic mm-hmm. and, and lovely, and it's a great team there. Uh, but primarily, Alexi is someone who works on the fellowship uh, part of it. And uh, with respect to, you know, just the process of the applications, etc. So it's offered every year. Uh, and the stipend for the year that I got received it was about eight thousand um, dollars. I I know it, it changed. Um, it was different for a year before me. It's probably the same for this year, but yeah, it kind of changes depending on the funding. But the applications are typically due around February, mm-hmm. and you are expected to provide uh, I think three letter of recommendations. You you are supposed to have a partnership with an organization that works on a human rights issue that you are interested in. Uh, and that you're proposing to work with in the summer. So you need to have that collaboration almost set. So if you are proposing to start work in like May or whatever, then in February, you should have that letter of support. So it, I think one of the key things is that you got to start working early for this fellowship. Um, and like I said, the applications are due in February, but they do some information sessions in sometimes in December, but typically in January and, and uh, early February as well. And I think those are very helpful to seek mm-hmm. more information, more detailed information, et cetera. I personally find, found out about it because it was one of the centers I was actually interested in. So I knew about it uh, even before I got into Berkeley. I looked it up and I saw their work and they do some incredible work. Um, um, so it was a center I was always interested in, but I also know knew of a few people who were fellows before me. And okay. so I also heard the firsthand experience of going through this fellowship, et cetera. So I think that kind of strengthened my um, resolve of kind of applying and trying to get this um, fellowship. Mm-hmm. Um, once you receive it, the process, so, be, okay, so let's, so this is pre deadline. So say pre like Feb, this is the sort of thing there's in, there's info sessions, deadlines, typically in Feb, you want to have LORs, you want to have letter of support, you have to have a whole SOP, you have to focus on the human rights element. So like I said, health is a human right for all those people who are working in public health can place their work from a human rights, uh, uh, health as a human rights lens. Yes. And, um, you do have to show some human rights sense in in your application. It cannot be a very public health heavy application. You have to say how you are kind of approaching it from a rights-based lens. Um, So you got to bring that out in your application. That's, that's, that's one of the tips I would, I would give. Um, In my case, I submitted the application. We did have a few calls back and forth. They were not necessarily interview calls. They were more um, calls to, elaborate further on the sort of work that I would do, how I can switch it. The Ukraine crisis had, crisis had just started. So the application deadline, I remember, was 20th February and 24th February is when the Ukraine uh, crisis kind of started. And so I was proposing to work with this organization in Croatia. It's called RODA. Yes. And we were uh, we had another plan. And But when this crisis happened, a lot of people started moving into countries in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, et cetera. And so there was a refugee population that was also coming into Croatia. And a lot of uh, and the government wanted some of these organizations to divert some of their resources in supporting these refugees. Yes. So my partner organization decided to do that. And so I sent them an email saying that while I submitted my application with this Um, you know, with this proposal, there might be a change given, you know, the change in the situation in the region, etc. And so we had a few calls and conversations around that and how uh, that shift is going to happen in the work that I was proposing. Um, Yeah, and then I got in 
after I got in, there's typically one pre-meeting that happens, which is like almost like an introductory meeting where you introduce all the fellows. I introduce, they go through some of, you know, the protocols um, and um, yeah, and you kind of talk a little bit about the summer work you're doing. Then you are on the field. You basically work wherever in the world you're working. You mm -hmm. come back, there's a meeting post field work, um, which is where, you know, people typically kind of report back in some way, share their experiences. Um, and then the final uh, part of the, I mean, there's obviously a lot of feedback evaluation pieces right. that goes in when you're on field you are supposed to you know submit some paperwork reports etc of like how your field work is going all of that mm -hmm. um and then it ends with a ted talk style presentation which is kind of almost like a conference that is held and all the fellows are presenters and mm -hmm. um so they divide panels um throughout the day and then there are about three to four presenters so you do your own individual presentation and then you sit on the panel and have q a with the audience mm -hmm. um and so that post uh, fieldwork meeting basically starts preparing you for that TED talk mm -hmm. and it ends with a TED talk and finally with some evaluations and feedback and stuff. But okay. that's how the year kind of looks like with respect to the fellowship. Um, yeah. And I think that's the, um, if there's anything else you want to ask specifically, but I think that's broadly how the process yeah. Hi guys, this is Tyra Pierce, your host for this episode, and we have reached the end of part one of this conversation with this amazing speaker. Don't click out yet because part two to this conversation has already been posted. So go ahead and click over to the next page and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and Spotify page.